In the early 1800s, two artefacts arrived in Britain. One was the collection known traditionally as the Elgin Marbles, after the man who imported them, the Earl of Elgin. The other was the Rosetta Stone, which is named after the town of Rashid, which was near to the fort in which the stone was found, and because centuries of European bloody-mindedness somehow turned Rashid into Rosetta. These are two hot-button artefacts when the conversation turns to repatriation. The question of what artefacts museums, particularly in countries which practiced colonialism, should send back to their places of origin. There are other iconic objects which are brought up, such as the Nefertiti bust I discussed in a past video, but the Rosetta Stone and the Elgin Marbles were extracted from their places of creation at about the same time. The Rosetta Stone arrived in Britain in 1802, and although the marbles would not be fully removed until 1812, the first pieces started their long journey to Britain in 1803, so the same British government had a hand in both. Sort of. We'll get to it. Actually, we'll get to it now. I've talked about the circumstances surrounding the Rosetta Stone before, but here's a quick recap. If you want a little more detail, you can watch my short series on the stone, which I'll link in the description. Napoleon Bonaparte led an invasion of Egypt in 1798, bringing with him over 150 scientists, engineers and artists, known as savants, to survey, document and acquire Egyptian antiquities. During efforts to strengthen the walls of Fort Rashid, several stones used in the construction of the fort were found by the French to be carved with hieroglyphs, having been plundered from ancient buildings by Egyptian workers in years past. One of these was the Rosetta Stone, notable for featuring Greek writing alongside the familiar but unreadable hieroglyphs. Recognising the potential importance of the stone, the French officers set it aside for study. The French would ultimately be repelled from Egypt by a combined campaign of allied British and Ottoman forces. Egypt, though in practical terms fairly autonomous, was an ayelet, that is a state or a province, of the Ottoman Empire, and Sultan Selim III called upon his British allies to join the campaign against the French, which actually would take place on three continents, with battles in places such as Malta, Egypt, and Syria. Though the French leadership made claims on the antiquities they'd plundered, most of them were surrendered, some to the British forces. This all happened under the supervision of both Ottoman leadership and the Mamluks, the regional ruling faction of Egypt, who had their own tumultuous history with the Ottomans. And of course, one of the surrendered antiquities was the Rosetta Stone. It came to Britain, where it was sent to the British Museum to be stored and studied. While the military campaign in Egypt was ongoing, in another part of the Ottoman Empire, a man born Thomas Bruce, who inherited the title Earl of Elgin at the age of five from his elder brother, was appointed by the British Crown to be the King's Ambassador to the Sultan. Elgin, being a British aristocrat, had a fascination with the classics, and keenly wanted to commission casts and drawings of the Parthenon sculptures. By the way, a lot of people, myself included, prefer the term Parthenon marbles to Elgin marbles, even though Elgin marbles is the more common term, so from now on, I'll be calling them the Parthenon marbles. Anyway, when the government refused to pay for Elgin's artistic project, he took up the mantle himself. He was stationed in Constantinople in the Sultan's court when he commissioned the project, and arrived in Athens in 1802, briefly, to inspect the progress and provide more financing. One of his agents, an Anglican priest named Philip Hunt, fearing for the state of preservation of the marbles and allegedly hearing rumours that pieces which had fallen off were being recycled for materials, sought a firman, that is, a statement of formal permission from the Sultan to remove the sculptures for the sake of preserving them. The marbles would end up having a terrible time getting to Britain. The ship they'd been dispatched on, Elgin's personal brig, the Mentor, sank near Kithira, and divers had to spend three years recovering the marbles. What's that about it being better in British hands? The expense of the recovery project would prove ruinous to Elgin, along with the divorce suit he filed when he discovered that his wife had been doing some extracurricular plundering of her own. By the time the marbles had been brought to Britain after a three-year brining session, Elgin had spent in total the modern equivalent of £4 million acquiring and shipping them. Adding insult to injury, his career as a diplomat was over, oh, come on! because he'd been carelessly taken as a prisoner of war by France and paroled partly on the condition that he never have diplomatic posting again. 
the point is, between the scandal from his divorce and the expense of the divorce and the Marbles project, Elgin was done politically, socially, and financially. To help settle things with his creditors, Elgin sought to sell the marbles he'd ruined himself acquiring. Though he did get a more generous offer from Napoleon, Elgin sold the marbles ultimately to the British government for less than half the cost of acquiring and shipping them. Now, it's worth pointing out that the British government were initially reluctant to take the marbles off his hands because there was something mighty fishy about the circumstances of their removal. So, they held public hearings with testimony from Elgin and his agents, including the spy priest Philip Hunt, whom, by the way, Elgin had never gotten round to paying. Elgin produced a translation of the alleged Furman giving permission for the marbles to be removed. Always hold on to your receipts, gang, even if they are sometimes dubious. A key passage of the Furman reads as follows, though I've cut out some extraneous bits. It is written and ordered that the said painters in setting up scaffolding around the Parthenon and taking moulds of the same ornaments be not disturbed nor in any way impeded by the commandment of the castle nor any other person and should they wish to take away any pieces of stone with old inscriptions and figures that no opposition be made. To this day, no copy of this firman has been found by the Turkish government so the Italian translation handily provided by Mr. Hunt is all the evidence that remains of it. Elgin also made the case that the removal was hardly a stealthy matter. It was done over the course of years, in full view of the Athenian voivod and the military commanders of the Acropolis garrison. But by the way, the committee investigating the matter did know all about the bribery that greased the wheels, but the bribery wasn't a problem legally or really morally. It was nothing outside of standard diplomatic practice. Officials tended to have to be bribed even to do their actual jobs, let alone to conscientiously not do them. It was one of the chief reasons that wealthy aristocrats were commissioned to do diplomatic work. The investigation of Elgin cleared him. I suspect because of documents issued from Constantinople to Athens, which retroactively said, yeah, that's fine. Now to me, it's a bit strange to have to say, yeah, that's fine, after the fact, if you already said it was fine before the fact, but huh, what do I know? Honour satisfied, the British government took possession of the marbles without criminal charges, without rejecting the sale, and without sparking a diplomatic incident with its Ottoman allies. Even so, it wasn't universally accepted by the British people that Elgin had acted honourably or legally. Now, the legal case was, of course, over. It had been declared lawful for his team to remove the sculptures and ship them to Britain. But many people with an interest in antiquity decried Elgin's extraction of the marbles and the desecration of the Parthenon. The poet, Lord Byron, an admirer of many things associated with ancient Greece, lamented... Dull is the eye that will not weep to see thy walls defaced, thy mouldering shrines removed by British hands, which it had best behooved to guard those relics ne'er to be restored. Cursed be the hour when from their isle they roved, and once again thy hapless bosom gored, and snatched thy shrinking gods to northern climes aboard. Yet Byron's objections, like those of latter-day Greeks, would pass barely noted by the British government. Okay, so, our two artefacts are in the British Museum. Not this one. Originally, the collection was housed in this building on the same site, but it proved too small for the immense hoard that would later accrue, and in the 1840s it was demolished and construction on the current building began. Both the Parthenon marbles and the Rosetta Stone find themselves at the centre of repatriation discourse and repatriation requests of varying formality. The Ottoman Empire, of course, does not exist anymore, and to my knowledge, the Turkish government has not made any claims on either. But, it being quite a large empire, there are many successor states, and two of them happen to be Egypt and the Hellenic Republic, Greece to its friends. Greece has been a lot of countries since the removal of the marbles, but requests for their return date back to 1835, and 150 years later a different Greece in the same place, Greece, filed its dispute with Britain over the marbles with UNESCO, the Educational and Cultural Agency of the United Nations. Central to repatriation debates is the idea of legality and property rights. But the thing is, property and ownership are difficult to establish over ancient artefacts. What is modern Egypt to ancient Egypt? 
Same geographical location, yes. Biological descendants, yes. But they're not the same country. They're not the same society, or even the same paradigm of civilization. What right do we in Britain today have to excavate ancient burials on our own island, just to satisfy our curiosity? What are we to them? And what is legality? I don't want to sound like your first college professor opening your eyes, man, to the real truth. But you know that a government can just make things legal, right? That's what happened with the Elgin case. The Ottoman government and the British government both decided after the fact that the damage Elgin's agents had done to the Parthenon and the removal of its sculptures to Britain was above board. They did this, of course, by moving the board. Because, while a courtroom can declare an accused person innocent of a crime they definitely committed, a government can declare itself innocent. Side note, this discussion is a far cry from cases where existing indigenous populations find their culturally relevant artefacts and even the bones of their ancestors in museums run by their colonizers. Those indigenous societies still exist, and storing their material culture for display behind glass serves not to preserve the societies they come from, but to exoticize them. Indigenous cultures around the world are not alien or consigned to the past. They're living, they're here, and now. In those cases, it's unambiguous to me. Those sorts of items need to go back, or at the very least be offered back, to the descendant communities. And maybe if those communities are not so disenfranchised in society at large, they might later consent to being featured in museums of multicultural national history displayed in the appropriate context. But that would be up to them. Now, I'm not the arbiter of whether modern Egyptians are a descendant community to people who lived 2,000 years ago or before, but I'll add my feelings about my own national history. I don't feel as though I'm a meaningful cultural descendant of the Anglo-Saxons, or whatever you want to call them, you know who I mean. I'm presumably biologically descended from some of them, and I live on the island they lived on, but I'm not the inheritor of their culture, material or ephemeral. Some British people feel differently. I'll leave that point on the mat, let you ruminate on it. And look, if you feel differently about your own culture and your place as an heir to the human history of the land you live on, that's fine, and honestly, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Anyway, Parthenon, Elgin, Rosetta. The question of legal ownership, of property rights, sidesteps the vastly more important issue of social justice. Is justice served by the British Museum continuing to hold the Parthenon marbles? Is it served by flinging antiquities back to their lands of origin? Though, let's be real, that's nobody's actual plan. Also, calling every artifact that ends up in a land not of its origin stolen or looted muddies the discussions of artifacts that were definitely stolen, looted, or otherwise unethically seized. The Benin bronzes, for example. And what if the French forces in Egypt had managed to get the Rosetta Stone to Paris? That wouldn't be even remotely as good a provenance as the stone actually has, even if you think its actual provenance today is dodgy. Former Prime Minister of Greece George Papandreou, who in 2000 was the Foreign Minister, testified at that time to the UK Parliament that legal ownership was at best a secondary concern. More important were the ethical arguments, the cultural arguments. In this, I think he was right on the money. The only cultural value the marbles had to Elgin was that he thought they were nice looking. Remember, he only wanted to sketch and mould them. And his overreaching chaplain took advantage of a conflict between Athens' military and civilian leadership to squeak by a highly suspect case for preservation. And it probably didn't hurt that the authority over the marbles was at this time in the hands of the Ottomans. Not any Greeks who may have had more of an attachment to the legacy of the Parthenon. The Rosetta Stone as it currently exists isn't that beautiful, or even remarkable. It wasn't treasured as a cultural artifact when Europeans happened upon it. The invading French forces thought it was interesting since it had Greek writing on it, and the British clearly thought so too since they put in a case for taking it. Undoubtedly, many things were claimed as war spoils by the British that had less functional use for their scientific endeavours, but that was the basis under which the stone was given. There's no evidence that its importance was underplayed to the Egyptian authorities. And I've got no time for the idea that the British Empire could bully its ally into relinquishing something so important if that ally really wanted to keep it. Not when that ally was the Ottoman Empire, commanding one of, if not the, most sophisticated armed forces in that part of the world at the time. And from what I can tell, though I'm happy to be corrected, neither the Ottomans nor the Mamluks took so much as an impression of the inscription. Of course, there's the rub, pardon the pun. All the work done on the stone's inscription could have been done with a likeness. In fact, some of it was. Champollion, the scholar who is ultimately credited with the final translation of the hieroglyphs, was working with a copy. 
And I guess another side note, this is not a British Empire stand channel. Everything about Britain's foreign policy was cynical, and alliances were made and broken as befit its government's needs of the day. Undoubtedly a factor in Britain's considerable participation in the Sultan's military campaigns was an eye to the potential reward, including the capture of any antiquities the French had pried loose. This is vulture behaviour, except that vultures do it to survive? Within two generations, Egypt would be recognised as an autonomous vassal of the empire, and during the First World War would gain independence with British help. British help is not always the sort of help you want. Kindly, the British Empire placed the independent Kingdom of Egypt under its protection. Egypt was never formally a part of the British Empire, but British armed forces would not leave Egypt until 1953, and it was not voluntary. Now that is what we call a devil's bargain. The Parthenon is perhaps the symbol of ancient Greece. It's so symbolic of that society, famous for its philosophers, statesmen, intellectuals and rich culture, that when you search for classical studies or related terms, you'll see images of the Parthenon as often as not. When the Roman Emperor Augustus decided he was fed up with Rome being entirely made of on-fire wood, it was the Parthenon that represented the style of architecture he wanted reflected in his new capital city of the known world. George Papandreou, speaking to members of the British Parliament, called it the greatest national symbol of Greece, and a symbol of Greece's immense contribution to the cultural heritage of humankind. He'd come to the UK in 2000, not to reiterate his government's demands that the marbles be given into Greek ownership, just so that the British government would loan them in time for the 2004 Olympic Games. The Olympic Games, an institution right alongside the Parthenon in the Greek contribution to world culture. The Acropolis Museum in Athens, which was founded in 2003 and opened publicly six years later, has a wing ready to receive the marbles. The sculptors are long gone. Their society vanished from the earth, but their creation, beautiful as it is, remains with us. And while I have my qualms about calling the present-day Hellenic Republic a successor to that very distant society, why does London have the sculptures again? Oh yes, because they're beautiful, and came at a bargain. The Rosetta Stone has a different story. In its full glory, it probably was very striking, decorated as stele were with heraldic gods and solar emblems, but it wasn't valued by the last Egyptians to have possession of it. They saw it as a large piece of very hard stone, excellently placed should a cannon ever be fired at it. Its ancient function is royal self-congratulation. Its meaning to modern Egypt is negligible in that context. Even in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when artefacts were leaving Egypt by the shipload, with government permission, something as unremarkable as a stela with a bland decree on it would probably have been given to the archaeologist's government of origin without a second look, unlike, say, the Nefertiti bust which had to be smuggled out. Except that the Rosetta Stone happened to be one of the keys to unlocking not only the ancient Egyptian language, but the culture and its history. Now, it could have done that at any point between the 7th and 19th centuries, but it happened not to. So all of the value the Rosetta Stone has as a cultural artefact, outside of just being a piece of classical Egyptian carving, comes from it having become a piece of scientific evidence 220 years ago. The Parthenon marbles weren't really recovered or saved. Any evidence for them being in danger is fairly flimsy, but the Rosetta Stone could have been smithereened by cannon fire. The French forces who took the fort it was found in had no business being there, no right to rescue or document anything, but that's only part of its story. The Egyptian authorities oversaw its transfer to British hands. It had been looked at before and deemed useful construction material. It was then looked at a second time and deemed an appropriate gift to an allied nation, the spoils of victorious war given by a grateful leadership who could have kept it if they'd wanted it. I'm not saying the Rosetta Stone would serve no justice if it were sent to Egypt. If a future British government decides to give it back, I won't be chaining myself to it, weeping that it's leaving London. Replicas already exist, one of them exists in the British Museum, certainly more can be made. I have an opinion about whether it's a moral imperative to repatriate it, and you might be able to guess what that opinion is, but it's not my job here to just tell you what I think. 
I've told you its story, and if nothing else, even if you thought the Rosetta Stone should be sent to Egypt before you watched this video, and still think so now, I hope I've at least shown that the stone and the marbles don't have the same story, don't have the same meaning to the respective countries that have made requests for their return. Not that governments speak for their people, or that a population is ever a cultural monolith. I'm getting to the point, maybe I'm even slightly past the point, where I'm just not qualified to discuss this issue more deeply without more research into the current scholarship around repatriation generally, and these artefacts in particular. But my closing thought is this. We who criticise colonial looting often decry the fact that ultimately, the arguments for why places like the British Museum or the Smithsonian or the Louvre are entitled to hold on to everything they currently have boils down to a case of finders keepers. But when we fall into the trap of talking about property rights, about the legality of the export of artefacts, about the primacy of states and governments over peoples, and who occupies what land when, we're doing finders keepers too. Bypassing the much more difficult discussion of real social justice, bypassing nuance of provenance and moral rights and the concepts of the successions of culture, supporting a position of returning everything without question, is no more fair or just than supporting a position of returning nothing. We end up doing imperialism's job all over again, but still feeling morally pleased with ourselves. Look, either the world's about to end, or it isn't. If it is, well, we won't have saved it by hastily emptying the British Museum of its Egyptian antiquities. And if it isn't, we have time to discuss this question of repatriation. We just need to make sure we're having the right discussion. Thanks for watching. I know this is always a controversial topic, and it's been heating up in recent weeks. You know what I always say, if you have a different view than mine, or think there's something to correct me on, drop a comment. Just keep things safe and civil, and you can disagree with me to your heart's content. You never know, you might change my mind. It happens all the time. Please show some love to Legal Kimchi and Hoots, who kindly read me some quotes. Their channels are linked in the description, and you could have a really good time if you only subscribe to them and watch their wonderful videos. Huge thanks to my Patreon backers for their support. Pharaohs Edmund Kybird and Joe, Nomark Steph, Architects Ken Pointer, Michael Bowman, Photosynthetic and Think Cork, and Scribes Carly G, The It You Trash Crew, and Pete. You are the real treasures, and I'd fork out to send divers to rescue you anytime. Until next time, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.